Welcome everyone to today's webinar session in the Change for Climate Lunchbox series. Our series opened on February 22nd with practical tips for individuals to prepare for extreme weather and emergency events. Today's session marks our final one in the spring 2022 series, and we're going to feature the research results of one of the projects supported by the City of Edmonton's City's IPCC Legacy Research Grant. And we're going to hear about the results of research that explore the impacts of work from home policies in support of the city's remote work program and its climate commitments. My name is Heather Wheeliker, and I'm here with my colleague, Karen Young. Both of us work in the planning and environment services branch with the city. We're joined by Stephanie Drozda with Alberta EcoTrust Foundation, our partner for the city's IPCC Legacy Research Grant Program. Please be aware this session is being recorded. At this time, I wish to acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory in the Métis Nation of Alberta Zone 4. We acknowledge the diversity of Indigenous people and their ancestors who have marked this territory for centuries. This acknowledgement creates awareness and is a reminder that we are all Treaty people regardless of where we are from or what language we speak. We stand in solidarity with and support Indigenous people and commit to continue our individual and organizational journeys of meaningful reconciliation. I would now like to welcome Stephanie Drozda, who will facilitate our session today and introduce today's topic and presenter, Stephanie. Thanks, Heather. Uh, I'm a program specialist with Alberta EcoTrust Foundation. Um, also joined by my colleague, Diane, here today, who's waiting in the wings in case my uh, Zoom crashes or internet fails. You never know. Uh, so she's here to provide support. Thanks for uh, that support, Diana. Um, so since 2019, we have partnered with the city to deliver the city's IPCC Legacy Research Grant Program. I'm excited to be joining you all today. Um, to help share the results of the research from this unique program, which is advancing knowledge about how Edmonton can become an energy sustainable and climate resilient city. So it is now my pleasure to introduce today's uh, session presenters. Uh, Rebecca Fiesel Schaefer is a mission driven results oriented professional, passionate about advocating for local change, energy efficiency, and climate policy. She is currently the chair of the board of directors for the Alberta Energy Efficiency Alliance, chair of the Climate Innovation Fund Executive Advisory Committee for Calgary, and sits on the board of directors for Alberta EcoTrust Foundation. She is also a proud senior level executive and Indigenous leader with over 20 years of experience in energy management with a depth of knowledge in research, design, and delivery of climate change policies and plans coast to coast. In 2020, Rebecca founded RFS Energy Consulting and Research Group to apply decades of experience and knowledge and push climate change policy, research and planning into action across Canada. Rebecca is joined by Christina Podlaski, a senior consultant with RFS Energy Consulting and Research Group since 2020. She is an, Edmonton, an Edmontonian with degrees from both U of A and the U of C, and her background lies in managing diverse projects that promote a successful social and economic energy transition. Christina was a lead researcher on the city's IPCC research project and is now leading a subsequent project titled Remote Work, an in-depth assessment of impacts at community and municipal levels. Uh, this project was funded by Alberta EcoTrust through the Climate Innovation Fund grant program. So it's my pleasure to welcome both Rebecca and Christina and we are looking forward to hearing about your research and results. So I'll turn it over to you two. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us, and uh, thank you for having us here today. As Stephanie mentioned, I'm Rebecca Fiesel Schaefer, and with me is my colleague Christina Podlatsky with um, RFS Energy Consulting and Research Group. Um, I do wear a few hats, and so thank you, Stephanie, um, as chair of the Board of Directors for the Alberta Energy Efficiency Alliance, um, an organization that advocates for energy efficiency in Alberta, as well as sitting on the Board of uh, Directors for the Alberta EcoTrust Foundation. Today, Christina and I are going to talk to you about a research project that started in the fall of September 2020 and um, is all around the impacts of remote work. So the next slide takes us to, um, I'd be remiss to not thank um, the City of Edmonton and the Alberta EcoTrust um, for funding the project through the IPCC Legacy Research Grant. 
Um, I'd also like to thank our partners and, um, you know, I again, I would re be remiss to not acknowledge the fact that without uh, grants like this, projects that are in the innovation and research space um, would not be able to go forward. So thank you. Um, as you can see on the slide here, all of the partners on the research project were all members of the Alberta Energy Efficiency Alliance. Um, ourselves, RFS Energy, um, SATE, the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology, uh, Dunsky Energy and Climate Advisors, as well as the Alberta Energy Efficiency Alliance overseeing um, and providing general guidance. The next slide takes us to just a very brief introduction of our organization at RFS. Um, we work with municipalities, think tanks, government agencies, and academia to translate research and innovative concepts and ideas into direct measurable climate change action. Um, you know, what does this mean and what does this look like? Well, we provide advisory services to connect dots and partners and stakeholders and pull it together to get it on the ground movement. Um, we provide advisory services in market research, service design, uh, survey design, apologies, uh, program management, and, and really work with organizations in the nonprofit sector um, and government across the country. Now to, to take you back, so please bear with me for a moment, but we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the research, but first I wanna take you back to really where the concept was originated and the potential value identified. Uh, I guess if we, if we try to think back and forget about the last two years and think back to a time pre-COVID with no masks, and I know it's hard, but um, you know maybe you remember this, sitting in an office, having water cooler conversations, lunch dates with colleagues. Then we go to the next slide and, now, how about this? Well, a lot of us had long commutes, rush hour traffic, congestion, uh, maybe the smell of, of diesel fumes. And if we're being honest, the mo most of Canadians do commute via single passenger vehicles. So on to the next slide. So, you know, the pendulum swung and it swung fast and it swung with force. And, you know, before we knew it, March 2020 hit and this, uh, <laughs> has been some of our reality or a lot of our realities over the over the course of the last few years. Our group and our team at RFS really saw this as an opportunity, um, a potential environmental opportunity. We looked at the pandemic and said, what if this horrific event that we thought might come to an end sooner than it has, maybe it would provide the opportunity for change. We started looking into the st stats and to be honest, Alberta, the Alberta market, according to Stats Can, actually has an opportunity for 39% of the jobs to be done remotely. With only 13% of Canadians actually being engaged in telework ahead of the pandemic, we looked at this stat and thought, wow, there's sure an opportunity to, to, for change. We felt that there would be um, a potential large shift in workplace culture that could be occurring. And that would ripple not only to workplace culture, but it ripples through our energy usage profiles, our building usage, needs and design, real estate markets, work-life balance, while well, the list goes on and on. But ultimately we saw this as a huge environmental opportunity that had yet to be measured. So the next slide I said, it says, I found mom, she's in the boardroom. <laughs> And just to be clear, the COVID state of telework is not reflective of the long-term work and, and what it can look like moving forward. With schools shut down and no options to go into the office or even out for supper with friends or family, this is not a true representation or what we wanted to research. What we were looking to research is the next slide, which is this balanced approach. A lot of organizations have termed um, I've coined the term hybrid or flexible approach. This is what we wanted to research. We wanted to see if there could be the best of both worlds, have our cake, eat it too, have our roads look like this during rush hour, but still have those collaborative whiteboard sessions with our teams. So what could we research to stop the pendulum from swinging back? What could we work on with the city of Edmonton to support the adoption of their program, you know, it, provide insight to best practices for their remote work program and provide potentially a tremendous opportunity to realize a tremendous opportunity for long-term massive um, change to workplace culture, but also commuting practices. 
Especially with 85% of employees being surveyed throughout the pandemic across Canada, expressing an, a want to have some flexible work. So now we'll get into the research. Um, the concept was pulled together. The RFS engaged the stakeholders through the Alberta Energy Efficiency Alliance. We would research not only the opportunities of remote work, but also the other side. What are some of the risks and the drawbacks? Uh, we looked at it from a, you know, a three lenses, environmental, social, and economic. The goal was to assess the positive and the negatives, like I mentioned, uh, working with the city of Edmonton and really looking to hope, hopefully complement and support their newly formed remote work program. We were looking to gather additional data, research, modeling, and, and, do, and, and do this through an employee survey. The project included not only that survey, but also a high level inventory um, through a literature review and gap analysis, the development of an energy efficiency guidebook. We looked at, um, we really wanted to explore the burden, burden of energy use on employees when working from home. So the next slide, these are the inputs. Our research project and methodology was simple. We would look at four inputs and you'll notice five bullets here there was a fifth that was recognized throughout the project that would add value so we started with four um, the first being the city of edmonton was fantastic and i do have to acknowledge our partners um, that did support the project and work with us we met with the with the city bi-weekly over the course of the research project and they provided us the materials employee data that existed to inform their program SATE led the literature review and gap analysis supported by RFS. Dunsky Energy um, led the modeling and calculating the GHG emission reduction potential. We uh, at RFS led the survey design and uh, stakeholder engagement, including the analysis of the survey, the final report, and the, the energy efficiency guidebook. Throughout the over, overall, throughout the duration of the entire project, the Alberta Energy Efficiency Alliance provided guidance and advise, advisory support. And that last bu bullet is a municipal working group. And we looked at benchmarking and gathering data from communities across Canada and including that in the, in the research. And we'll talk a bit about that later. So the next slide is our first input. Um, the first uh, priority was really to establish a baseline. We met with the city of Edmonton staff and, and, and dug through and they shared their materials and all of the data that they had collected um, to inform their program design. We wanted to understand all of the factors and considerations and data that went into their initial concept. They launched their long term flexible work program for employees in September 21. And ahead of that, they had had the foresight to really be a leader in their community. So ahead of COVID, they had hired and dedicated staff to looking into remote work and what a long term program could look like for the city. So we did meet with them and um, these are on the right hand side of the screen. These are all the different factors that were considered um, as part of the design of their program. They shared with us the initial catalyst of, of why they started looking at remote work. They talked to us about the timing and the approach. And again, they shared those program materials, their surveys, their feedback from employees, and then all of the employee supports that they developed for their program. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to hand it off to Christina. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, our next input uh, was an in-depth thematic scan, literature review, and gap analysis. Um, this was conducted by our project partner, SAIT, and we wanted to uncover the current state of remote work research. Um, the biggest uh, finding was that there was a lack of relevant Canadian data, and you know, and our, our goal is to put things into action and working with the city of Edmonton, how much of the research that's out there is going to be applicable. There's case studies from Chinese travel agencies and, you know, Google and companies like that, but what can be implemented on the ground in the current state. Um, so we looked at the, a lot of the themes that were out there in the research and then looked at what the city of Edmonton cared about. What could we 
be putting together, um, what numbers could we be putting together in terms of transportation mode, commute time, and urban impact? Um, are City of Edmonton employees going to be as productive? So we wanted to take a few more tangible pieces um, and pull them out of here and form the baseline for our research. So within each main category, the environmental, economic, social um, opportunities, there's quite a few. The um, opportunities within remote work are, are vast. And as everybody has different um, work patterns and um, preferences, um, we also want to be able to capitalize on that while reducing our footprint and finding a way to engage people and attract talent from all over the country or world, depending on, on what you're looking for. Um, so taking advantage of the opportunities and minimizing the risk. So we found um, quite a few, some of them that at this stage of the research were not viable research opportunities. Um, what's happening in downtown cores or consumption patterns. There wasn't enough of a data set um, to really look into these. So future research is going to explore a lot more of these items. And then on the other side, um, the risks as well. Um, over time, I think that we're going to see a lot of these um, appear in research in different ways. Um, and depending on the organization and the goals, um, each one of these can be studied differently. So we took a few um, pieces out of uh, the main risks as well and looked at home energy use, um, office and equipment expenses, engagement levels, team collaboration, um, employee wellness as a concern as it was the kind of early stages of of the ongoing pandemic. And then our next input um, was an analysis of the potential GHG emission reductions through remote, remote work. And this was conducted by our project partner, um, Dunsky Energy and Climate Advisor. So what they found was that a teleworking policy for the city of Edmonton could reduce direct emissions by 70% for those employees. Um, this, uh, was based on a lot of inputs that they put into their data model, including um, census data on emissions intensity of each commute type, so car, truck, public transport, active transport, um, the average share of rides per commute type in the Edmonton region, the average commute distance by mode of transportation, the estimate on number of days um, each employee would be working remotely, and the number of employees eligible for the remote work program, and expected uptake of uh, the program as a whole. So if 81% of commute trips by car and truck are an average of 15 kilometers in Edmonton, one way, and the average employee participating in the program works three days a week remotely, um, you can see a reduction of nearly one ton of CO2 per remote worker per year. Um, looking at the program as a whole, and given the alarming prices of gasoline right now, the savings for um, you know, that, that amount of gasoline not being used would be roughly a million dollars right now. So one thing that this project didn't look at was the indirect impacts of remote work. So we looked at just the commute savings with the data available, um, but the rebound effects, um, they're, they're numerous. Um, so there's a lot more work to be done in this realm. So maybe think about how many errands you'd run that normally would be tacked on to your, not your everyday commute to work. Um, you still run those errands. So you know, how far are you going? How much time are you spending in your car for those things that we would have previously uh, lumped together? What about money that you saved money that you spent eating out at restaurants downtown, um, you may be spending that on activities or you know, trips that are not uh, carbon neutral. So there's a kind of, there's all of these trade-offs that need to be explored further. Um, this uh, table is from a study done in France that Dunsky uncovered and they, they did a, a little bit of work in determining what these could be, but um, as we're seeing now that there's a lot more work to do and this is, um, hopefully going to be part of future research on our end as well. 
Our next input was a survey administered to City of Edmonton employees um, who were eligible for the remote work program as it was in March of 2021. The survey had three main goals. Um, wanted to get a, a pulse on employees at a time of disconnection and upheaval. So employee well-being was a major focus. Determine if there were any gaps in what employees wanted or needed from the remote work program. And then we wanted to validate and exter validate external findings and um, benchmark on key topics, including productivity, commute costs, and wellness in general. And what we found is that people really wanted to talk about remote work. Um, we reached uh, over 900 people, 900 responses were received, and 3,400 comments. So it wasn't just clicking through the survey, it was, I want to tell you about this is what's working for me and this is what's not. So really the, the, goal, the goal in this um, exercise was reading, reading those comments, a lot of them quite funny and enlightening. Um, responses were consistent with the research, um, productivity increase. Um, people perceived their teams as being more productive as well. And uh, team engagement was lower. People were unsure of what was expected of them. And they're used to um, meeting their supervisors and coworkers in, in a face-to-face -face environment. Uh, the comments, uh, I wish I could show a lot of them, but um, we're keeping those under, under wraps. But many factors making a case for remote work. Um, there's finding, the, finding confidence in the autonomy it provides being able to make healthier choices uh, at lunch, having your emotional support dog sleep on your feet, being able to pick up your two-year-old tornado from daycare, and um, being able to easily meet with people in different departments virtually and you know, potentially break down silos or find new ways to innovate and collaborate in ways that you wouldn't see um, in the office. Um, people spent more money on their utility bills, internet service, Home office equipment, um, but overall, this was deemed a small price to pay for the flexibility. Um, but a strong statement uh, rang through in the comments that people miss their coworkers, they miss the conversation with people once a week over coffee, um, the bad jokes from the usual suspects, and the ability to look people in the eyes and read body language to solve problems. So a few interesting um, findings that came out of the survey, um, those under 40 had the most positive remote work experience. Those aged uh, 30 to 40 had the greatest desire for flexible work hours. Those under 35 and over 50 uh, desire more team collaboration and engagement. Females aged 30 to 50 had the highest stated increase in focus and productivity. And in nearly all cost categories, um, males deemed the impacts to be higher. These included cost of utility bills, childcare, home office supplies, and internet service. And now I will hand it back to Rebecca to discuss our next input. Thank you, Christina. So the final input to the research project that was conducted, <clears throat> excuse me, um, was an unexpected input, something that wasn't planned. And um, what we realized throughout the duration of the project through our conversations with City of Edmonton staff, but also other stakeholders and other communities was that data gathered across communities could be hugely impactful and beneficial for the research and the outputs, but also to justify program and policy policies around remote work, um, as well as the details in those programs. So as one community put it on, on a phone call when we were doing stakeholder conversations, um, overseas data just won't fly. And with senior leadership, they felt that they needed Canadian data to justify the remote work programs, policies and program details, as I mentioned. So in an effort to do this, we um, we worked with the city of Edmonton and on our behalf, they sent out as they sent out an email to the large city caucus of Canada and asking if there would be any communities interested in sharing information or data or even having a conversation around remote work. I'll be honest, we were blown away. We had over 15 communities respond within the first week and over 20 some communities within a few weeks. 
there was obviously a need to share and collaborate and discuss remote work. Um, the vast majority of communities across Canada had no remote work, no plans to do remote work and programming. And, the, and when COVID hit, what they realized and what their survey showed and what the data that they shared with us showed was that employees and Canadians want some form of flexibility. Interestingly enough, there was an Angus Reid survey done where over 80% of Canadians expressed the, the want for that flexibility, but actually expressed a desire and, and mentioned that they would change employment. 29% uh, said they would actually consider moving jobs if they didn't receive it upon returning to the office. So on, on that note, as part of this research project, we had engaged with, you know, over 20 communities, we had six of those share survey data um, and research that they had done on remote work with their staff. Um, unfortunately, though, comparative analysis proved to be a bit challenging between communities with the raw data. Um, due to limitations um, that arose uh, for privacy concerns with um, employee data sharing. So uh, we did get to do the comparative analysis, but uh, weren't necessarily able to include it in the report uh, publicly. We also saw discrepancies obviously between survey tool design, which made it a little more challenging. But ultimately at the end of the day, what rang really true and really loud and, and to, to build on what Christina had said, um, people are interested in exploring what remote work can look like and are interested in talking about it and are interested in seeing how it fits into our future future work life balance. So um, what we did hear from the communities was that yes, they had done their surveys, they had talked to their staff and a resounding support and want was expressed by employees across Canada to have some kind of hybrid or flexible approach moving forward. We also found that there was a resounding um, numbers around productivity, not only from employees saying that they were more productive, having that flexibility and having those extra hours, but also from managers in, in, the, in some of the surveys that we, we saw across Canada. So um, to be honest, when we saw the outreach and we had the expressed interest from communities, we saw this as an opportunity to bring those communities together and start sharing. And so City of Edmonton led the first few town halls where we gathered all of the communities together to start talking about remote work. Right now, we have over 35 municipalities from across Canada that meet on a regular basis to share lessons learned, best practices, materials, policy documents, um, all looking to build on and explore what space usage can look like, um, what booking facility software is used, et cetera. So there, you know, this was a bit of an add on to the research project, with, but definitely um, additional value. So the next slide is around the key findings and Christina and I have already talked through all of the inputs of the project and the key findings from each, but this is a bit of a summary, a very high level summary, and it includes some that we haven't talked through today. So, um, at this point, I would, I would encourage everyone to visit the Alberta Energy Efficiency Alliance website under the publication section, and I'll have the link at the end of, of the presentation, but um, there is a, the final report that we were able to share publicly. Um, to Christina's point, we were blown away by the amount of thought and consideration that employees were willing to, to put into their responses on the survey and any of the surveys we saw across Canada. This is one comment that was shared, um, and I'll read it. By working from home, I'm able to eliminate the travel time to and from work, which is about an hour and a half per day. Having this extra time is so valuable to me. I find it allows me to get a little more sleep and aids in productivity. Also, this extra time allows me to exercise, which helps with my mental health and also spend time with my family. These, were, these comments were not uncommon. And so I feel like they're, um, they're something to share. The next slide is the energy efficiency tips for working at home. One of the rebound effects that we do recognize and is an increased energy usage at home. 
And one of the ways that we thought we could offset this potentially un <laughs> unquantified energy usage was to develop and work with the city of Edmonton on doing, um, doing a tip sheet on energy efficiency tips and behavior changes for employees while they work at home. The guidebook is currently has been integrated into the onboarding package for all city of Edmonton employees that do currently work at home. So the next slide is project recommendations. So there's a, a sample list here. Again, there's more in the in the research report, but ultimately there's still a lot of work to be done, especially in a time that organizations, both private and public, are deciding on what to what back to work looks like post COVID or if if ever that exists. They need to think about, you know, what do facilities look like? How much flexibility is too much flexibility or not enough? How do I keep my employees engaged? What are, you know, and, and what our group really is interested in, in learning or sharing or and, and researching is what are the best practices around remote work that could save the most GHGs in the future? Is there some set of best practices around facility space per person? Is it, you know, 10 desks per 20 employees now versus one desk for one employee. Um, there really is a lack of data around this topic, specifically around in a Canadian context. And the first bullet is the GHG modeling and measurement, um, which would be around the rebound effects, which Christina touched on. Um, and, and is one area that, yeah, we, we simply don't have the data to understand what some of those rebound effects are and how are they're impacting the potential for additional GHG savings. Um, some of the other additional research and recommendations of, of the research um, that came through our research was really looking at the down, um, downsizing potential for facilities, the space usage and redesign. We're still at a point where we don't know how many individuals are going to, or organizations are going to end up back in the office. And when they do, how do they, what does their space need to look like to support their work? Um, one of the other opportunities that lacks in terms of data or Canadian data, I would say is the, the risks and how they impact different demographics differently. This was something of a concern of ours and, and was recognized right at the offset was that, you know, there is the potential opportunity for increased energy usage at home, uh, potential costs for equipment or internet service. Um, are, you know, do these impact different demographics differently? Um, I would guess yes, but how so and how are those then mitigated? The last slide uh, before we go to our Q&A session is um, I won't go into too much detail, but I would say again, a big thank you to the city of Edmonton uh, for funding the IPCC research or legacy research um, and this grant program. As you can see, these are this is a sample of some of the projects that really did start from that initial research project. So from helping to support the city of Lethbridge, which we're honored to support over the last few years, um, we helped develop their remote work program, uh, design details. We're working with them currently to establish a measurement framework and surveying their staff and get a pulse on you know, remote work impacts. Uh, in, in the city of Toronto, we're working with um, a number of partners, including Pollution Probe, a leading uh, think tank and nonprofit in Canada. We're looking to assess the changes to commuting and environmental impacts um, that come from and stem from staff uh, working remotely at the city of Toronto. We're also, the third bullet is the Climate Innovation Fund. So we were fortunate enough to receive funding and work with our partner state and Dunsky Energy Consulting and Climate Advisors again to look at this time, the GHG emission reduction potential for businesses in Edmonton rather than Edmonton as the or city of Edmonton organization. So over the next year, we'll be looking to, to explore how businesses in Edmonton what the potential GHG emission reduction potential can look like from a remote work and what are some of the best practices that they should be looking at to, to gain the, that impact. The last bullet is our, our 
communities in Alberta that we'll be working with. And we're a proud, we have a proud partnership with SAIT. We're really excited about this one. Um, it's funded through the Alberta Real Estate Foundation. And it's really looking at um, the real estate market in Alberta, some of the impacts to downtown, uh, downtown office downsizing facilities, um, overall the general real estate market and trends that we're seeing in our province um, because of remote work. So again, these are a sample of projects that have stemmed from from the initial project that we talked about here today. So this is um, my information as well as Christina's. Um, we're open to, you know, if you're not comfortable in, in sharing questions here today, you're welcome to reach out to us um, as individuals with other questions. I also have the report, the final report, the, the shareable version. Uh, we weren't able to share all of the, the data that was gathered across Canada, but um, the shareable version is on the Alliance website, as I mentioned, under the publication section. So, and I think at this point, um, I'll hand it back to Stephanie. Thanks so much both to Rebecca and Christina for that excellent uh, presentation and really fascinating results. Um, something that really resonated with me, which I think demonstrates um, kind of the benefit of this, the city's IPCC research program is um, that comment about overseas data not going to fly with decision makers. And so that's really one of the goals of this research program is to, was to get relevant data uh, locally to help with uh, climate resilience and energy transition decisions. So uh, it was great to see that not only this has helped the city of Edmonton, but you're also having an impact across Canada with um, improving our understanding of this. So that was that's really great. So I think we have um, a few questions coming in. Um, uh, Dale just said, excellent presentation. It was great working with, <laughs> with your team. So that's a, a lovely comment. Thanks, Dale. <laughs> I would, Stephanie, if I could, I would like yeah. to, I, I was wanting to thank Dale during the presentation because she really did take the time out of her day to help support our team. Um, you know, sending out the email to municipalities, running the working group while she was in the role. Um, she met, like I mentioned, she worked with, uh, and worked with us side by side and meeting with us bi-weekly. So, I mean, she went above and beyond in terms of the expectation of the city for this project. Um, and it, I think it really did make a difference in terms of the output. So thank you, Dale. So another question we had just come in. Um, I noticed that the city of Red Deer was not mentioned. Um, and I understand that this is a need in our community not being fully met. Um, I've been working with several nonprofits with great ideas on how to build this knowledge base in our city. Can you help us bring the topic to the public via a documentary about healing ourselves and the way we interact with our resources? So maybe do you have any other plans to kind of share this um, more broadly with the community, perhaps? Uh, one, I would invite the city of Red Deer to participate in our working group. Um, they currently are not a member. So if, if um, I see Heidi's put in the comment, I would welcome them to, you know, I'd welcome Heidi to reach out and we can have a conversation about how, how to get the, the city of Red Deer on board in terms of a, a wider audience of residents in Red Deer. Um, I would say, you know, I'd be happy to do a presentation there or, or share the research in any way. Um, we're always happy to talk and <laughs> um and share what we've learned and even connect the dots like that that is the intent of our organization our rfs is really to connect stakeholders and i feel like the municipal working group is a really great example of that great um all right there's another question and i think um renee looks like she put in some names of the city of red deer that could be good to follow so thanks for that renee um, uh, if there is a true cost, municipal budget and environmental benefits to the increased remote work, work from home scenarios, and climate change reduction is a key target for cities and the country, I would like to see governments lead by encouraging this transition work. So yeah, I don't know if you want to speak to kind of, um, in your experience, who has been leading this work, I, I think you talked about the communities that were involved. Um, yeah, any other yeah. thoughts on that? Um, I would just say out of all of the communities that we talked to, Ottawa was the only community across Canada at this time, right? I mean, things could have changed, but when we reached out to everyone about a, a year ago, um, they were the only community that was looking at the GHG metrics around potential savings and looking at it as an input into the design of their program. So I think 
Edmonton is obviously a leader and they have commissioned this research or, or supported this research and, and are interested in learning more about the GHGs. But I don't think we're at a point where uh, because we don't have the research on all of those rebound effects and we have a true value of what that could look like at this point, you know, a lot of communities think that there's an opportunity and we think that there's an opportunity, but it also really depends on what the design of that program looks like. So um, for instance, I would say if you're heating your home full time and you're heating your office full time and, and there has been no change in facility space and there has been no encouragement to staff to reduce their energy use at home, there has been no tools provided to maybe talk about when you do commute, now that you're only going in two days a week, don't jump into your car right you know maybe you used to take public transit but now because you only go twice a week maybe you pay for parking um you know all of those are still unknown variables so i think what we're seeing is that there's a lot of research being done uh, by carleton university out east with the city um or in the city of ottawa um but the city of ottawa did, was able to actually share some of the metrics that they had done around ghd modeling but that really hadn't been on the radar for other organizations it was really to be honest COVID hit and a lot of communities were like wow we were maybe thinking about this and now we have to think about this and then post COVID if you could call it that now I don't know but <laughs> um, now they've really heard a resounding interest from their employees saying we want this we want some flexibility what does that look like and part of that for us is yeah so what is the ghg opportunity and then how does that align with their with their plan so that's a fantastic question um there's another question about uh, are there any distributed pilot projects under consideration to get better measures of the impacts and risks so maybe are you aware of anything beyond kind of the municipal level of any other research um, I would say the Carleton University has a number of projects underway, um, one specifically that we've talked to them about, which is, is measuring the at-home energy use increase. Great, and Heather had a question. Uh, she was wondering if, uh, was there anything really surprising about research, uh, about your research you uncovered? Hmm. I would ask uh, maybe Christina, is there anything that uh, you wanted to share that really shocked you throughout the, the research? Uh, maybe if you want to go first. Yeah, I think there were a lot of really interesting um, nuggets in the survey um, responses and all of the comments that we received. Um, just about how uh, how people working normally side by side in the same department, presumably similar activities, um, had such different viewpoints on how they work, how they're productive, um, how they like to engage with their colleagues and their supervisors, and what they want out of the remote work experience. I think there was a lot of enlightening uh, aspects in there about how you know we're. we're collectively supposed to be doing, going along the same path, but how we get there isn't necessarily the same. So I found a lot of um, value in the, the survey comments. Yeah, that, that's, it, it was, it, to be honest, it was really interesting throughout. So I would, I would agree with Christina. Um, one of the things that resonated with me was having a conversation with a small community in Alberta. Um, they had joined the working group. They said their community was a resounding, the organization um, was a resounding, no, we're not considering this. As soon as we can get back to the office, we are, we've had a few restaurants close downtown. Uh, this is not an option for our employees. Uh, she participated in the working group, found out that around 90% of the communities participating were actually already either considering it or designing a program for their communities, took that information back to her community and got an immediate, okay, well, maybe not a no, but we'll consider doing a program, but we need to, to learn more. So that's the potential opportunity with collaboration and information sharing that we've seen come from this project, which again was not an initial input. We, we hadn't thought or included the outreach across Canada, but it ended up being so meaningful, I think, to a lot of those that are participating in the working group. Um, but that Alberta example is so interesting, right? It was one conversation of, hey, look, this is the data of the survey that they had from communities across Canada. Canada, 
everyone else is looking into this. We need to as well. And then it was no longer a no. It wasn't a yes, but it wasn't a no. <laughs> and the impact that something like that can have um, was really surprising to me and, um, and started to make us look at the project a bit differently. Great. Thanks so much. So I think that that looks to be the end of our question. So um, thank you again, Rebecca and Christina. A really interesting, really great questions uh, to hear about the different directions that, you know, the unexpected places uh, this kind of research uh, can take us. And the collaboration was, was really great to hear um, that that was able to happen with this research. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Heather to um, share a few more things and we'll wrap up. Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And I echo your comments. This was a really informative presentation and it certainly provides our climate strategy staff with lots to consider. And uh, we look forward to your future research as well. So thank you so much, Rebecca and Christina. And thank you too for the audience for the questions that you've asked uh, for, and helping us to dig a little bit deeper into the research uh, presented today. So that does bring us to the end of our spring lunchbox series. Uh, recordings from all sessions are posted on the website within a couple of weeks, and some sessions are augmented with additional written information pieces. Uh, should demand for this series continue, uh, we may offer um, additional sessions coming up this fall. So there are many ways that you can engage with the city and stay informed about our climate change work. So please don't be shy to follow us. I'm quite thrilled that we were able to showcase this important research with our IPCC legacy research partner, Alberta EcoTrust. Thank you again, Stephanie, for co-hosting today's session. And I'm going to pass it back to you for final words. Thanks, Heather. Uh, it's been a pleasure to co-host these sessions with you and hear about this uh, great impactful research. Um, so thanks again to you, Heather and Karen, for um, providing support and facilitating this online. And of course, thank you to Rebecca and Christina for sharing your research. We really appreciate the time and effort you made to present your important and timely research. Um, and again, thank you to the city for co-hosting this with us. Uh, last but definitely not least, thanks to all of you, our audience, for spending uh, your time with us today. So just want to wish you all a terrific afternoon. Take care.